<clears throat> this is chapter 5 of God's book, Isaiah 53, in the day of the Lord, that he dictated to me after teaching me the materials over about a five-year period, uh, the New Testament and the Hebrew Bible, which I had never read. I've been an atheist for 50 years of my life. A life he orchestrated came to me at birth as he did Jeremiah. But he didn't tell me he was with me. And my life certainly doesn't back it up. Not as you would think a life would be with God. Not with all the problems and injuries and afflictions by God that I've had. But... Uh, I'm the man he selected. And I fit the verses better than anybody. And there's one verse in particular, be hard for anybody to top. top. Isaiah 53, 10. God chose to crush him with disease, but he shall be given long life. He shall see his children, which of course has nothing to do with Jesus Christ. He is exposed to death by this disease. That's what crushes him. They told me I had a month to live. This was following colon cancer, surgery, opening up my belly from the top to my sternum. The same cut they made when I got shot through the abdomen when I was 18 years old from two feet away. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of easy, and there's a lot of people like me. So many bad things happened, dysfunctional family, that uh, God was just never on my mind. I've never had any training, uh, synagogue, church, anything. And uh, to the extent I had friends who considered themselves religious, we certainly never talked about it. Maybe they thought that was just a good thing around me. I don't know. But... Uh, you would think nobody more surprised to me when God finally speaks to me when I'm 50. But he's got power over your emotions and your thoughts. Basically, he put a knowing into my mind who, of who he was before he said a word. And it was just as though he had been with me forever. Just like Adam would have felt. You know? Before Eve, he just uh, lived in this incredible place and there happened to be an a, a, a invisible person. It's probably what he, what he would have been thinking. With power. With power to do things. But um, it's very interesting. And that's in the second book, The Life of God's Righteous Servant of Isaiah 53, which is, it really just points to the areas of pain, suffering, sorrow, affliction, uh, wounds, you know, things of that nature. Uh, the, some of the worst things in my life are put in there because then I fit the definition of who the man of Isaiah 53 is. Man is suffering, familiar with disease. But uh, anyway, and this kind of leads into to why I started with that. I wasn't sure why God was mentioning Adam, but uh, this is uh, chapter 8 of Isaiah 53 in the day of the Lord, God's book. The first host, and you have to look at my, this is chapter 8. Go look at chapters 1 through 7 if you want to know what that is. The first host, of, and I'm one. The first host of the Lord's host in creation was Adam, a man created very much like the angels in heaven, which I know as in my knowledge that he taught me to be Elijah. You know, the only man specifically taken to heaven and God sends him back in the day of the Lord as the messenger to clear the way for God and as it says in 53, for a purpose that might prosper. Doesn't tell you what the purpose is, 
or tell you why God would have a purpose that only might prosper. You, you know, that's something you just shake your head at. I have the answers, of course. God drew from the elements and materials of the earth. Dust is how it's phrased in, in the Bible. And formed the first human being, an adult man, with the mind of a one-day-old baby. When the breath of life was given to Adam, the first thought in his mind came from God. And that thought came from God, who was being Adam for Adam. I am Adam. I am Adam. Was spoken by God as though he was Adam and was perceived by Adam as being his own. Thoughts and inner voice. This done in order to build a memory for Adam until the mind of Adam was fully formed as an adult man. God based his being Adam on the mind, the soul, and spirit of Adam. Who Adam would be if Adam had been born a child and raised in Eden by the voice and power of God. In the beginning, the conversation was God talking to Adam through his Holy Spirit, who is an angel, the angel of God's presence. They had been together. And as himself to Adam, the spirit and soul and mind of Adam listening and learning and forming into a function, functionable adult man. As a host conversing with God for Adam was, as, was a natural part of his existence. And then God created the second human being and the second host, an adult woman with the mind of a one-day-old baby. Same process. It's very similar to the process for angels, too. When the breath of life was given to Eve, the first thought her mind, in her mind, came from God. And that thought came from God, who was being Eve for Eve. And God said, I am Eve. Spoken by God as though he was Eve and was perceived by Eve as being her own thoughts and inner voice in order to build a memory for Eve. God was not Eve. He was being Eve for Eve until the mind of Eve was fully formed as a functional adult woman. God based his being Eve on the mind, soul, and spirit of Eve. Who Eve, who Eve would be if Eve had been born a child and raised in Eden by the voice and power of God in the beginning. The conversation was God talking as Eve to the Holy Spirit and himself to Eve. The spirit and soul and mind of Eve listening and learning and forming into a functional adult woman as a host conversing with God for Eve was a natural part of her existence. I think my lighting is too low. I think it looks too dark. I'll keep working on it, and I think y'all can watch it enough. This, this is how he, uh, well, it's in the chapters before this. I won't go back over it. Uh, how he created the angel of his presence. He created an angel, but instead of giving him a body of human form with wings, as we think of angels, no, his body is the spirit of God. Now, I'm in my spirit. My person is. My person basically is my spirit. Uh, and we'll get to that. I got, to, I got a whole chapter on that. Because in, in heaven, you don't have a mind. 
God becomes the information of your mind. And he can speak just like you. And when they do that, because they've shown me, they show me every day now. <laughs> it was a slow progression. But uh, they're the information of my mind. The difference in me and you is that they've been with me from birth. And they don't forget anything. And uh, God can bring me memories uh, of something as exciting as uh, starting and driving your first car, at least for guys. Um, but the incredible thing is, it's as though it's happening again. I don't just remember it and say, oh, I remember I was so excited. Okay, no, I'm talking about feeling the ambience, everything. You're in the car again, you know. It, 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 all of a sudden, my memory is like a vision. Used to do it an awful lot, not so much these days. Uh, maybe the first five years was the most. All kinds of, oh, and they send pictures to my mind all the time. When we're talking, God says, uh, they say a picture's worth a thousand words. So when we're talking and we're using words, talking is, is really more like spirit to spirit. Or you would think more likely like uh, uh, reading minds. Except, of course, God doesn't have a brain. And in heaven, you won't either. But the minute he speaks like you, it's like it's your thoughts. You can tell the difference if you really think about it. But he probably doesn't let you. Um, and this is my knowledge as Elijah. Why does he take just Elijah up? specifically in the Hebrew Bible, and sends him back. Well, he asks this guy who says he's Elijah, tell us about heaven. How are angels created? What's it going to be like when, when I'm gone? Well, <laughs> I'm teaching you right now. I'm the only teacher God recognizes. He doesn't recognize a rabbi on the face of the earth. They're all dismissed according to the Hebrew Bible. When Moshiach comes, and I'm here. I know a Moshiach because the Spirit of God had lit upon and entered me, and then I could hear God speak because God's in His Spirit. Isaiah 11 may have just as well read, except God was being very crafty in His writing, like He always is, and um, it could have said the Spirit of God and God. A lit. Uh, upon the twig of the shoot of the stump of Jesse. Uh, Jesse being the father of King David. And uh, Ezekiel said, God was speaking to me. And at that moment, a spirit entered into me. Now, if God's speaking and a spirit enters you, that's going to be the angel of his presence, the Holy Spirit, because they're always together. And Ezekiel says, and then I could hear his words after he entered Ezekiel with, his, with, with the angel of his presence, the Holy Spirit, who is a person. Instantly, Ezekiel became a man in divine beings. Jacob said, I wrestled with a man in divine beings. And he did, and there's a little story wrapped up in that, and there's a chapter on it. I think it was the last chapter, maybe, even. Um, all, Jewish people, all of your prophets were men of divine beings. If you can repeat or write God's words, or you can write the words he wants to speak himself, ask himself, then you're a man of divine beings because he's inside of you. Now, he also fills this room, as does the angel of his presence. They're almost like they're co-mingled. I mean, God is still one. I mean, he created the angel. He's one. And there's some separation shown in uh, a story that also shows the Spirit of God can talk, can be grieved, can get angry and not forgive you. I don't know why Jesus doesn't think he's a person. Because once you do that, you never figure out a man of divine beings. And a man of divine beings can do a lot of things. Because God's controlling my mind and my words. Think about that. You can get a lot of things done. 
Because God knows what everybody, if you, if we were in a room, every one of these thinking about. What, what will appeal to you most and what I deliver in a sermon or a speech, for instance? And uh, now, he, never tell, he would never tell me what any person is thinking or anything about that person. Um, he calls it, you still have to live the human existence. And we're not going to tell you anything unless you could know it of your own if you did a little work. Yeah, they don't tell me anything. I'm not on the executive committee. If I was, I would no longer be in the fire refinement, which I'm still in. Last year was the worst of the 16 years. It was, I mean, for about four years, it just escalated, getting harsher and harsher until it was 24-7 of pain, sleep deprivation. Um, and I'm not going to go into all of it uh, specifically, but he, he can make you hurt anywhere. He can make it feel, he can press down your stomach from the inside. <laughs> Believe me, it's not a pleasant experience. And I'm not talking, you're hurting for five minutes. You might be hurting for five minutes telling yourself, I can't take this another second. You know, and a week later, you're still saying it. <laughs> Are you numb with pain and about to pass out? He says suffering makes you stronger and it also changes your emotions. And once you, I get you to where I want you as you can be taken, to a place you can be taken, from there I'll use my power to make it better. And we've been doing that the last week or so. I told you last year was real bad. This year is starting out a lot better, easier. Uh, not, not, not that I still want to be in this thing. I don't. And I just can't imagine what he thinks I, I can't take. That I had to have emotions that are just completely stilled. You know, anger being the top one, which he would have had to work on with Moses. Now Moses, we first see him, he kills a man in anger. But at the end of his life, it is said that he was the most humble man on earth. I said, you had him for 40 years. That doesn't surprise me. <laughs> he didn't he knock the stuffing out of you. I don't know if any of you have ever seen a wild horse broken for riding. I can't even watch it. It is a brutal experience. I mean, they just beat on that horse. They knock it to the ground. And on and on until the horse finally just got, you know, shoulders sagging. It's like, get on. Okay, I had enough. Or it's like a raw cadet going uh, into the Marines and going through a boot camp and this and that and, and turning into a Marine or a Navy SEAL. You know, and all of a sudden you got skills. I have knowledge. I have knowledge. Uh, and that's what 53 is about. He makes the many righteous by his knowledge. And, of course, he's teaching me the scripture the whole time. And then I typed the scripture in blogs. And we took the blogs and put them together in different ways. And uh, we did a bunch of doubling out. And we had the book. Uh, sometimes I would learn things while I typed. Generally, I had a good idea. But uh, because he would have me read a particular book and we'd work on it all night. Uh, like Ezekiel. Uh, and, and things will crop up where I have questions. Uh, before, <laughs> I was a lawyer in Hawaii and Texas, and I was board certified in Texas as an oil, gas, and mineral uh, interest specialist. So, you know, I knew what it was like to make good money. You know, I wasn't rich or anything. But um, the second week he was with me, I said, uh, God, I had to take some seminars on the computer and send some money in for my law licenses. And he said, no, you're never going to practice law again. Don't do anything with those licenses. Let them terminate. And, you know, that kind of hit me. Well, you know, it's God telling you, you, you don't get too upset. And I said, what am I going to do for money? 
He said, he laughed, he chuckled. <laughs> this is him right here using me. Remember, he's inside of me. That, that was his laugh. <laughs> That's it, more like it. You're not going to have money. <laughs> you know, it's, and I, I thought back, religious people said, Jesus said the rich man can't get to heaven. Not supposed to want material things. Well, he took them all from me. I haven't had a car, bank account, driver's license. He made me lose my wallet. Don't tell me he didn't know when it fell out of my back pocket. Uh, but recently, since I turned 63, I'm getting ready to be 66, I started getting Social Security. It's not a bad amount. And I get room and board uh, at my parents' house, who are in their 90s. And, of course, I do a lot of things to help them, this and that. And it's paid for uh, and we're basically four people, my sister's here, uh, pooling our Social Security. Uh, my dad gets the most and I get the next most, but I got. I need to get these books published. Listen, I, God's not coming to Israel without me. He, he's got to have a man. He, he said, Keith, go tell them this. Moses, go tell the Israelites this. You know, go tell them, this is the tract of land I want for my temple. And tell them what we are typing up what it is to look like, uh, size, and everything else. And by the way, he expects uh, hotels to be put up all around it. So that the Jewish people throughout the world can take their two-week vacation every year. Come to Israel, so it's a boom for Israel too. Tourists. Tourists. Um, you know, go to the temple in the morning and then go enjoy beautiful Israel. It's a wonderful country from everything I can see. And uh, friendly people, happy people. Uh, and yes, there's danger all around you all the time. But building this temple is going to help a lot. Because they're also very superstitious. They're not a great reasoning of the mind, people. They act on emotion more than anything. Uh, the Arabs. Um, but he can't go without me. And I can't go if I don't get some help publishing these books, which, by the way, I, I have, Moses delivered one covenant and to a man the Israelites had to agree to it, and they did at Oregon. I will be your God, you will be my people, and you will obey my laws, commandments, and rules. And they said, okay. Of course, we all know. <laughs> Easier to say okay at a mass meeting than live it, but uh, it's not like he didn't know. Nobody was going to be sin free just because he said, I'm your God. You got to know how to read the Bible, and, and of course, I know God, and I know how he does. I don't know why he does some of the things he does. I just know what he does. Yeah, I can't figure it out either. This whole fire refinement thing. I said, you know, I would be like a battered housewife, you know, with a tick and scared of my shadow and everything else with what you've done to me. <laughs> Again, I'm not going to tell you. You know, I'm sure I'll have some close friends one day in Israel, and they may want to know. Uh, but... Uh, it's up to God. That's not. I have no self will. I'm not like any man on this planet, a man in divine beings. I don't have control of my very thoughts. He controls what I think of, what I can remember. Oh, well, we play that game all the time. We <laughs> be watching TV, and I said, "Hey, I recognize that guy. That's a. Uh, what show was he in?" And then I get it. I mean, I've gotten it for a long time. They're not going to let me come up with it. It's just little things, little frustrating, irritating things, which for the most part make me laugh. You know, I had a fiery spirit, and I guess it's still in there, but uh, I also can see the silver lining in everything. And uh, a very, uh, uh, being a lawyer and whatnot, or the reason I fell into being a lawyer was because I was good at reasoning. You know, if, it, if this is this and that's that, that means most probably what we're looking at is this. That kind of thing, reasoning. 
I mean, you can be uh, intelligent, be able to read and regurgitate everything you read. But what I see most people in religion have a problem with is they can't put books together. If you want to find out exactly when God's coming, it is so easy. You, but you've got to put together Jeremiah, particularly Jeremiah 31. Okay, new covenant is coming. Well, to be delivered. Why? The land blooms again. It says, see, a time is coming three times. And one of them is the land blooms again, and I'm paraphrasing. Uh, the ruined cities restored and Jerusalem rebuilt. Well, it's happened. The last sea of time is coming. I'm going to make a new covenant with you. Which, by the way, is really an amendment. Still your God. You're still his people, Jewish people. And uh, always will be. I mean, he says, I, uh, I married you. And God's not getting a divorce. I don't care what the Christians say or John or Paul said. That God has, uh, he's gonna, uh, he, he doesn't want the Jews anymore. He's coming to the Gentile. Well, they were sinning just as much as the Jews were. And, and Paul, well, anyway. Uh, I got a chapter on it. <laughs> Everything's covered. Uh, you can go from being somebody who's kind of, oh, well, first of all, it's Jeremiah, which takes you to Malachi 3. Because that's the only place you're going to see that covenant again. God says, I'm coming back to my temple. I sent my messenger before me. The angel of the covenant that you desire is on the way. And that's tricky, crafty writing. Why is the angel leaving early? <laughs> of course, I have the answer to that. But uh, that's the covenant of sin forgiveness that's in Jeremiah. It's not... It says, a covenant writing tore on your heart. But that's just a metaphor for what he says next. Because, because this was what writes it on your heart. I'm going to forgive your sins and equities and remember them no more. And then me being here and people, you know, the many in a multitude. It's not going to be all Israel. I already know that. I can't get anybody's attention after 16 years. But I, we're, we're working on that with these videos. And um, and they, this happened with the exiles. This is just a repeat story. Jeremiah has the covenant of sin and forgiveness. And in Isaiah... He tell, basically tells the exiles, the remnant returning, which was all 13 tribes, all you got to do is read Ezra, and you know that's a fact. It's no lost 10 tribes. Hell, the half tribe of Manasseh and Ephraim from the North Kingdom, the two largest uh, tribes from the North Kingdom, it says it in Ezra, settled in Jerusalem. You got to at least say, because everybody believes it's Judah and Benjamin, would be the two that weren't lost. Well, you got to say, well, eight got lost. <laughs> Four maybe. Except what? In Ezra, it is said, they gathered as one man, Israel. They all had to be together. I just saw this rabbi told me a singer doesn't seem to understand that. It's only happened two times. The Israelites, and that's where you see the statement. They all gathered, and they gathered as one man, which, of course, is Israel. The patriarch. And it, it happened with the remnant of the exiles, who God forgave of all their sins, and what they did? They built the second temple as a holy seat. So I get these books published, we got a holy seat on our hands. And see, that's going to get people back to synagogue. I mean, you don't want to um, start sinning again. You know God's here, and you've got a clean slate. Everything you did when you were young, or if you're young, the things you're doing, you need to stop and live a good life. Because God's laws are for us. Because he knows life is harsh. But you live by his commandment, rules, and laws. And you're always going to come out ahead of where you would be without them. You know, he knows people are going to sin. I mean, it doesn't even bother him. And then I hear all these rabbis talking about, well, if we would stop sinning 
God will return. 